Stanford University. Hello and welcome back to E145 Technology Entrepreneurship. In this video we're going to be talking about entrepreneurship in the life sciences and I'm happy to welcome a special guest, Stephanie Maris. She is a business consultant in Silicon Valley with 20 years of experience in the life sciences. She is also affiliated with the Stanford Technology Ventures program and a mentor in the class and she also teaches entrepreneurship globally. So thank you very much for being here and I look forward to your presentation. Thanks, Chuck. Glad to be here. Great. Hello everyone out there. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes telling you about life science entrepreneurship today. A very interesting topic and one that I hope gets your fascination and curiosity. So first of all, let me define life sciences. Uh, the way we use the term here is it refers to three separate components of the life science pharmaceutical biotech world. The first one is drugs, pharmaceutical drugs or biotechnology developed drugs. The second is medical devices. Those are devices that are put inside your body to do various things. And third is diagnostics, ways in which you can discover what the problems are with a human being, a human's body. So I'm going to focus primarily on drugs today because it makes all the points that are important and you have to think that these are applicable as well to devices and diagnostics but perhaps to a slightly lesser extent. So the first point is the human body is incredibly complex and that causes us all a lot of problems. Um, in problems in the disease process, problems in understanding what exactly has happened in a disease condition. Because we have literally billions of cells in our body. So imagine trying to figure out what has gone wrong and why is our body no longer functioning the way it's supposed to. So keep that picture in mind, billions of cells. It takes a very long time to test a new drug. And if you start back in the laboratory where scientists are literally working on various experiments in petri dishes, no humans, no animals, it can take five years to experiment in a laboratory and actually come up with uh, something that seems to work against a particular disease state. Following that, once you've identified a lead molecule, you can take it into animals um, most most of the time they use a laboratory mice, but in addition to that you have to test in a second species like goats or dogs or rabbits to try to mirror the human condition that you're, that you're experimenting with. And that can take one to two years once you've identified your animal models. So before you even get to test your drug in a human being, it takes six to seven years, a very long time. And once you get into man, and you have to get regulatory authority to do that, it can take five to seven years to take it through the three phases of testing that are required to uh, file with a regulatory authority to market a drug. So five to seven years in clinical research in man. So you can imagine that it takes a lot of financial resource to take you through clinical trials. In fact, the data shows that on average $200 million is required to go through three phases of clinical testing. Phase one, where you test for the safety of a drug, and you might test on 20 to 100 patients, can cost over $30 million. Phase two, which is not just safety, but also efficacy, does it actually work against the disease target that you've specified? You might test that in 100 to 300 patients at a cost of about $40 million. And then phase three, where you're testing, again, safety and efficacy, 1,000 to 3,000 patients this time, is about $120 million. So the total bill, approximately $200 million for an average clinical trial. And on top of that, only one in 25 drugs that enters trials, phase one, safety, actually succeeds in being approved by a regulatory authority like the FDA. So there's a huge attrition rate as you go through the various phases, either because the drug is found not to be safe or it actually doesn't work. 
So how do you fund all this? Well, people aren't writing checks for $200 million out of their bank accounts. They go for venture capital funding, uh, which is a, a topic in and of itself, but it's a, a source of significant sums of money. Uh, in return for having access to these funds, you have to give up the majority ownership of your company. And it's difficult to get venture capitalists to invest. So a second source of funding is uh, to take the, the company out on the public market, most usually on NASDAQ in the United States. Unfortunately, public markets have been pretty close to biotech and pharmaceutical plays lately. In fact, last year, 2011, there were only 16 life science IPOs out of the entire possible world of IPOs. So it's not a popular way to get funded these days. And a third way is to partner with pharmaceutical companies. They will pay some money for rights to the drug and then help you through clinical trials and ultimately marketing it. But all of these are very difficult um, to, to get funding for. Um, venture capitalists are looking to invest in later stage drugs, drugs that have already been de-risked. And you can't really do an IPO these days. And pharmaceutical companies also want later stage drugs because they have a need to replace drugs that are falling off patent in their pipelines. So none of these sources are particularly open and available. So now let me go contrast the difficult scenario I've just painted for you in life science entrepreneurship with technology entrepreneurship, which many of you may be testing out there. In, uh, you're looking on the left at a line, lines of code in technology venture, software venture. Uh, lines of code, those are something you can write. You can maybe make mistakes, you can take it into alpha and find out it's got lots of bugs, but eventually you can fix it and it's not that lengthy a process or that expensive. Or another kind of technology venture where you're actually designing perhaps computer chips or whatever. These are all technologies that are fairly knowable. Um, contrast that to the picture on the right, which is another picture of the complexity of the human body, the circuitry that exists that you have to impact. There's really a world of difference here. So characteristics of a venture in each of these arenas. In a technology venture, development time can take maybe 6 to 12 months. So it's relatively short before you can get something at least out on the market for alpha testing or beta testing. In life sciences, we've seen that it can take 10 to 12 years before you can go uh, out to the marketplace, going first through preclinical testing in animals and then in human beings. Um, secondly, there is no regulation in technology. If you want to do something, you just go do it, introduce it to the marketplace, and the market either buys it or doesn't buy it. Whereas in life sciences, there's heavy regulation, both the FDA in the United States and then uh, similar authorities in Europe and Asia. Uh, investment in technology, it's pretty inexpensive. You can get something out on the market for maybe a million dollars, maybe tens of thousands of dollars, whereas it can cost hundreds of millions of dollars in life sciences. It's a very expensive way to go. Then given that there is a lot less capital required in technology, your sources of capital can be as simple as friends and family, perhaps you bootstrap it, use your credit cards, whereas there's no way to do that in life sciences. You have no choice but to go for external sources of funding like venture capital, um, going public, or perhaps pharmaceutical companies. And then lastly, technology risk. There's a low technology risk on the technology side and a very high scientific risk on the life sciences side. So you might be asking me, well, why would anyone want to be a life sciences entrepreneur given the difficulty of doing that? And so the answer is, really on this slide, is that you want to make a difference in the world, in people's lives, and, and alleviate human suffering and ameliorate the um, difficulty of aging or disease conditions. You can actually make a huge difference in people's lives by developing a drug, a device, a diagnostic even, that enables you to deliver medicine differently. So it's really a greater calling. And if you're successful, you will have all the riches of the world as well, knowing that you have done something that really matters 
So I hope this has given you a brief overview of what it's like to be a life sciences entrepreneur. Um, there are certainly many success stories out there of people who have saved um, human, human disease by developing something, by being persistent, by raising the money, by taking this through clinical trials. And I hope that some of you out there will become one of them. Thanks so much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.